Well, good morning, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. It is my real pleasure and distinct pleasure to welcome Lee Westwood to the interview room. Lee, thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Really appreciate it. Um, Lee, you recently joked um, that players on the PGA Tour uh, have asked you when you'll be joining the Champions Tour. <laughs> However, your game is it's just in stellar uh, form after winning the European Tour's race to Dubai for the third time in 2020. You also recently recorded back-to-back -back runner up finishes on the PGA Tour at the Arnold Palmer Invitational and the players. To what do you attribute all this recent success? I think it's a cul culmination of a, you know, a lot of different things. Um, I've obviously been working hard at my game, but uh, I have a good team around me. Um, Steve McGregor, we work on uh, for the physical fitness side of the, side of the game. Um, ben Davis, I work on the mental side of the game, which I have done for three years now, two, three years. That's made a big difference. Um, uh, Liam, James on the swing. Try not to forget anybody. There's a there's a, there's a big team, uh, so it's not just one one thing that you know makes you play well. It's it's golf's got so many different facets. Phil Kenyon on my putting as well. Um, I went to the pencil grip, uh, which about two years ago now, which has made a huge difference. You know, when I go under pressure, I feel more comfortable under pressure, and uh, um, just to, just all that as and and playing well has you know bred confidence and maybe don't play as well as often anymore. Um, but when I do play well, uh, I tend to contend. And, you know, with the work I've done uh, on the mental side of the game, you know, I feel a lot more comfortable. I, I heard Jordan Spieth say something last week about, you know, he, he, he feels comfortable under pressure again and he's enjoying being under pressure and he can cope with it. And, you know, that's that's how I feel, you know, when I do get in, in, into the the heat of battle and, and close to the lead, I feel comfortable again. So... Uh, you know, that's a big part of it too, I think. Thank you. Well, this week marks your 20th Masters, and you certainly performed here well at Augusta National. You had runner-up finishes in 2010 and 2016. You know, what are your um, expectations this week, and what are your overall feelings about Augusta National? Well, I've always loved Augusta National. You know, I, you know, I just saw, saw that where it's my 20th. Uh, time here and I still remember the, the first time I came here like it was yesterday really and um, it's such a special place you know the traditions and you know you feel fortunate to drive down Magnolia Lane and it, it's always special you know the when the walk I, I, I think the walk over the 11th down the hill seeing the 12th in the distance you know it still sent chills yesterday when I mean I came here with you three weeks ago but even yesterday you know it sent chills down my spine um, just to see, you know, Amen Corner in the distance there. It's, you know, it's a very special place. Um, so what was, the, what was the second part of the question? Well, how do you feel about Augusta National? And, and more, more generally, how, um, how, how did you prepare for this year's, this year's Masters? Well, we came early, didn't we? And uh, um, played, played three weeks ago. Uh, yesterday I had a practice round. Today I'll just play nine and, and tomorrow nine or even less just to, you know, like 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 we've said, I'm I'm 48 in uh, in a few days' time, and you know the, the secret is to tone the uh, the practice and the training down as as Thursday comes. So I'm fresh. Um, my legs probably won't take as much as a 20 year old's legs will take, and uh, this is a physically demanding golf course. So you know I have to scale that back. Um, as for expectations, I don't really have any, um, but I don't have any any tournaments I turn up to anymore. You know, I just put the preparation in and uh, hit it off the first tee, try and find it and, uh, and hit it again. Hopefully get it on the green and have a birdie chance and make a few of those. After that, it's in the lap of the gods, really. Well, thanks, thanks, Lee, and best of luck this week. And Thank now you. with that, I'd like to open it up and field, have, see if you could field some questions. Please. You've talked about Ben's impact um, r repeatedly over the past couple of months. What was the impetus for, for turning to him a couple of years ago, and, and what's kind of the big, biggest significance he's had for you? It's been, uh, it's been going for a while. Ben, ben works with Steve Peters, and I've, I've worked with Steve Peters since about 2012, you know, just working on skills um, to make me feel more comfortable under pressure. And, you know, the older you get, the, the more... Mental scarring, I guess, there is there, and s sort of 
you have good experiences, you have bad experiences, the good experiences you want to remember, the bad experiences you want to forget. So um, they, they, they've both given me tools to, to combat that. And uh, I haven't seen Ben for a while, but you know, I speak to Ben and I speak to Steve whenever I want to. Um, you know, just have a little top up now and again. Um, and, and it works well. We've been doing it on Zoom lately because of the pandemic. And uh, I did a lot of hard work kind of two two years ago to 18 months ago. And we just keep kind of refreshing that. So uh, um, I enjoy working with them both, which is good fun as well. So and, and that helps, you know, it's always helps to, to be enjoying stuff that you do and work that you do. It always seems to have more of an effect. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's the psychological part of the game is a massive part of the game now. It's probably the biggest part of the game. What's one of the tools that he's taught you? I don't, I don't like to discuss them because, you know, it's a very private and personal part of the game. Bill? You alluded to seeing the 12th hole on that walk down 11. You've obviously played tons of par threes over your career, all kinds of courses. How would you describe what the 12th presents and, uh, what, you know, and, and what has been your sort of method over the years there for playing it? There's a lot of different things to take into consideration at 12. Obviously, you try and get the the yardage and then because the green sits at an angle to you, um, front edge, um, front edge on the right might be back edge on the left and um, you know front edge on the left might be in the water 25 feet right of the hole um, so you've got to get the right club obviously hit it the right distance um, the right trajectory in there because the wind swirls around a lot down down in that bottom corner and sometimes the flag on the 11th is going in completely opposite direction to, to the flag on 12. Uh, so I like to play like a, a, a keep it out out of the air as much as I can and play like a little knockdown shot. I very rarely do I. If it's flat calm, I'll hit one in normally. But if there's any kind of breeze blowing, I try and play a little knockdown shot in there because I find that obviously short's not great, but I always feel like long's terrible. And the only way you're going to get it long is by getting it up in the air and getting a gust and the ball carrying it. So if you don't get it up in the air, then, you know, you don't get that you sort of take the long one out of play and uh, I'm generally not aiming at a, a right hand flag. I'm, I'm, you know, if it is over there, I'm aiming over the trap. Um, I'll be aggressive to any other flags on there, but um, yeah, I prefer to just see like a little three quarter knockdown shot in there, control the ball flight. Sean? Some players spoke yesterday about resisting the temptation to kind of be too artistic here and, and learning to just play their game. Was that something as you played more masters that, that you realized that to not try to do too much in shaping shots and just playing the game you have? I think it's a very strategic golf course, probably one of the most strategic because a slight miss can really get you into a, a lot of trouble. I mean, even a good shot hit say five yards too far can get you into trouble or too, or short can get you into trouble. So I think playing the golf course under tournament circumstances um, is, is very valuable. And you learn a lot when you're playing previous masters. That's why I think you get a lot of repeat winners around here. And, you know, the likes of Fred Couples and Bernard Langer, people that have played it, you know, over the years a lot can contend and can get themselves into position um, because you learn where not to hit it and it, the, the golf course plays four different ways depending on the flag positions the four different days so you know you, you can play um, say the third depending on the pin position you know four different ways if you want to um, and there's very few golf courses where the pin position dictates how you, where you hit the tee shot. So I think it is a very strategic golf course and uh, you have to have a, um, a good plan before you go out there. And then obviously, depending on the conditions, you, you know, you have to ad adapt that plan. If all of a sudden the greens get soft, a thunderstorm comes through, you can be more aggressive. Say in, in November when we played, the golf course was nothing like it normally is. So um, you could play you could actually miss it in spots that you were terrified about when you were making your, your, your plan. Um, and you could be aggressive to certain flags. And 
Um, it, it wasn't, a, as everybody would sort of see, a, a true Masters. This week, it's back to where, you know, this is how the golf course should play, fast and firm, and this is how it is at its, its toughest. So um, you'll see, uh, I think, people who've got a lot of experience around here coming to the top of the top of the leaderboard again. Uh, before I turn to Rex, we have a, uh, Lee, uh, received a remote question from uh, Ian Carter. Jack Nicholas became the oldest winner of the Masters with his son on the bag in 1986. How much of an inspiration is that for you with Sam, your son, on the bag this week? Well, even without that, I mean, Jack's always been an inspiration. You know, the, the way he played played the game and his record, especially his record around here, you know, you can't help but being inspired. Um, you know, there's a few similarities there with age and, uh, you know, it, it, it would be great to break his record. So, uh, yeah, um, I saw Jack a few weeks ago at the Honda and, uh, you know, I still, I still remember uh, the first time I played this tournament in 1997, I played the final round with Jack and uh, I, I knew I was playing with him on the Sunday and I went out on the Saturday night and bought um, the picture, the iconic one where he's following the ball into the hole on 17 with his putter. And after we played on the, uh, on the Sunday, um, I'd done enough to qualify for the, for the following year, fortunately. I think we had to finish top 24 at that stage. And I said to Jack, I said, you, would you mind signing this picture for me? And I still have it to, the, to this day all framed up where he's put uh, to Lee, enjoyed our round, best wishes, Jack Nicholas. And, you know, there's very few people you would, you would do that with. He's, uh, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a legend of the game and, you know, arguably the greatest player to ever play the game. His, his record in the major championships and especially the Open Championship and, and here, uh, you know, is second to none. So it's... Uh, you know, I, I always have. I always enjoy uh, speaking with speaking with Jack and uh, picking his brains and and just being in his company, really. So to to have a chance to break one of his records would be very special. It's you know amazing that you know I'm old enough to have my son on the bag and uh, and still be competing in these tournaments and uh, and having Sam here to enjoy the experience with me. It's uh, you know, I have, to, I have to close his mouth every now and again when we're going around here. You know, he loves it, to, uh, he loves it so much. That's great. Rex? Kind of similar to that question, what was it like? I think you came up after the Players' Championship to play a practice round with Sam. What was that like, and what's it been like this week with him on the back? Yeah, it was very special. You know, it's a special place, and uh, to get to share it with Sam was, uh, was amazing. I set him a target of 86 the first day. We were playing right from the backs, weren't we? And... Uh, uh, the course was as, I mean, the course was as pretty much the same as we played it yesterday and the practice round was firm and it was fast, although there was more wind when we came up, it was blowing 15 miles an hour uh, and I made him play right from the backs as well. Uh, so I think he shot 87 the first day, and but he'd had a practice round then and got kind of got the feel for the place and I set him a target of 83 uh, on the second morning and it was cold, it was 45 degrees and windy and the greens were fast. Uh, and he doubled 16 to go 10 over. And then he bogeyed 17 to go 11 over. And then he chipped in from short right on the last for a, for a three to shoot 82. So he took the $20, uh, $20 that morning. And uh, he's never stopped talking about it since. He tells everybody about his chipping. Uh, Tim? Morning, Lee. Um, Morning. I, I know you're about a month removed from it now. But even for someone who's done as much in the game as you, those back-to-back -back seconds, earlier this year, what did that do for you from a confidence and belief standpoint? Did it kind of rekindle some things in a lot of ways? Yeah, it's very fresh in my mind still. Um, and it, it just is validation really that I'm still good enough at, the, at my age to be out here and contending. And um, two very different golf courses, Bay Hill, very long, um, TPC or play, Players Championship, Sawgrass, more of a tactical golf course, you know, you have to hit into certain positions. Um, you know, getting getting to play with Bryson the last couple of days in, in both tournaments, you know, is one of the best, top, probably one of the top five players in the world, you know, at the moment and uh, on his form and, uh, you know, going kind of toe to toe, losing by a shot to him uh, and losing by a shot to uh, Justin Thomas the following week. Um, you know, just, just the odd breaks here or there or, um, not not birdie in 16 at Bay Hill. Um, 
not not birdie in 16 and bogey in 17 at the, at the players championship you know having having a chance to win really and getting myself into contention you know is 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 good and you know shooting two pretty good final rounds um you know that, that those kind of things give you give you confidence um when you think about the finish at bay hill 17 and 18 it, it's some great shots there a little bit unfortunate to finish in a in a divot on 18 at bay hill but still wouldn't have been too aggressive to that back uh back right flag, flag but made a nice putt to make Bryson hole his and then on 18 um, hit a good tee shot down there and obviously obviously made a birdie to finish second on my own uh, hold from 15 feet so you know little things like that just uh, top up the confidence bank all the time. The look on your face after you made that putt like you turned and rolled your eyes and did a little exhale whatever it was it just seemed like you're just enjoying these moments so much whether Bryson was going to make his putt or not it just yeah. you were enjoying that moment is that just an evolution that comes with age or something along those lines yeah you know I love playing golf and you know all the practices to to get into contention and you know do it properly when when the heat is on and it was nice to hold that one down the green on 18 keep him honest make him all his you know, I didn't want to really miss that and leave him to have two putts to to win the tournament so just, just to see if he could, you know, step up and make his, and he, he put a great stroke on it and wrapped it fir firmly in the back. So, uh, yeah, you can't. It felt like it was, uh, you know, Bryson winning the tournament rather than me not, you know, losing it. So, uh, yeah, I think moments like that when you do go toe to toe, and it's a good experience for you and a good experience for everybody watching, are what the game's all about. David, uh, you mentioned how much you missed uh, fans. In when there were no fans, but um, how much has your resurgence been because of them? And even though there's limited number here, they're not having the par three contest. And how much did that help you or was it a fun thing? And did, would you just go over there for the heck of it sometimes? Yeah, I think it's a lot. Uh, the, there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot more intensity, certainly. Um, and playing with Bryson in the final two rounds of those tournaments, there, there may be only a, a certain amount allowed in um, at the moment to tournaments, but it pretty much felt like they were all with our group in those final two rounds. So there's definitely more intensity for me and the, the adrenaline flows more when the crowds are in. And I was saying to Danny and um, when we were playing yesterday, it was good to hear cheers again. You know, you you can read what's going on around this golf course just from the, just from the cheers, um, you know, whether it be a hole in one on 16 or uh, somebody holding a birdie put down on the 11th or 12th, 12, not so much on the 12th because no crowds kind of get near that green, but Eagles on, on 13 and 15. When you're stood at the top of hill, say on 10, you know what's going on all around. The, you know somebody's doing good and you're just waiting for a number to go up on the golf, go, uh, on the scoreboard. I remember, you know, in 2000 and, 10 having a quite a big lead in the third round uh, going down the 10th and Phil went on a run where he made eagle at 13 then hold his second shot at 14 and then I think he birdied 15 and I went from four or five in front to one behind but you know that something's going on and you know when it's a favorite an Augusta favorite you know like Phil or Tiger or Fred Couples or something like that or Seve that uh, or Jack that um you know, it's it's one of them and there's going to be some action on the scoreboard any second now. You probably haven't got a four or five shot lead anymore. Um, and you can tell that just from just from the, the, the sounds around the golf course. Three, not, are you missing a par three tournament? Yeah, I think, well, all the pros playing it, they all love playing the par, par three tournament. It's a, it's a great sort of, it almost feels like the the start to the, to the Masters, so it's a shame not to be playing, but I understand why it can't be played, and uh, uh, hopefully be be back here yet next year and uh, and get a chance to play in it. I think Sam misses it more. He wanted to have a go at that ninth hole with the wedge. <laughs> we'll take a couple more questions, uh, Ron. The uh, here more than any other place, we hear players talking about seeking the advice of guys who played before, sort of mentoring. When you first came here, was there somebody who you sought out for some advice? What did they tell you? And are you now one of the guys younger players seek out for that kind of advice? Yeah, I think that goes back to what I was saying about you learn a lot more about the golf course when you're playing it competitively rather than having practice rounds there. Around there. I picked a lot of people's brains. Um, Nick Price was, was 
you know, very helpful for me when I when I came here first time. And um, I think I had a practice round with Seve and Ollie. Uh, most of the Europeans tended to because they were successful around here. Nick Faldo's brains you would pick, Bernard Langer's. Uh, I still, uh, you know, even, even last year, I'm always trying to learn. I had a few holes with uh, Sandy Lyle and we were talking about different ways of playing the golf. Yesterday with Wuzzy, you know, he... I played nine holes with him and, he, you know, he's he, he gives little sort of nuggets of advice on, you know, where to hit shots and how to play certain shots. So, yeah, I think the game of golf, you always, you never know everything about the game of golf. You're always learning and even more so around Augusta. Any one spot or any one thing they told you about a hole or a shot here that has sort of stayed with you through the years? It's very much, like I said, depends on the pin placements. One day you're all right missing it in a place to a certain flag and then the next day, you, you know, you can't get it down in two. So um, it, the, the variables around here, are, you know, there's lots of variables in golf anyway, but they, they, there are even more around this golf course and they're magnified more because it's such a, um, a severe penalty for getting it in the wrong place. Paul? See, there are 10 Englishmen in the field this week. Uh, is this the strongest? Sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Oh, I'm sorry. There are 10 Englishmen in the field this week. Right. Is this the strongest contingent you can remember? And although you're all here as individuals, is is there a shared sense of pride among you? I, I don't I don't get that. No, I, um, you know, we are all here as individuals. But uh, I think on mass, yeah, we probably are the, the strongest contingent of, of Englishmen for, for quite some time, yeah. Does the course remind you at all of courses in England? We think of Augusta as an iconic American course, but is there anything about the design that reminds you of, of links in Britain? There's nowhere like Augusta. It's unique. It's what makes it great. Well, thank you very much, Lee. Really appreciate it. Have a great week. Enjoy yourself thank and you have much. fun with Sam on the bag. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.